Hello, Kidney Warriors. James here from Dadvice TV, your online kidney health coach. And this is episode 184 of Dadvice TV Live. Now, tonight we have a great topic that's very important for kidney patients out there. We're going to be talking about diabetes type 1, type 2, pre diabetes, and its relationship to kidney disease. And this is something that all of us really need to be aware of, even if we don't fall into that pre-diabetic type one or type two category. But before we get to our topic, I wanna to welcome everyone new. It is great to have you here. You're gonna find Dadvice TV very helpful, positive, and supportive. And let me take a quick second to introduce myself. My name is James. I was diagnosed about two and a half years ago. I couldn't believe how long it's been now with stage five kidney failure. <clears throat> and I was told I needed to go on dialysis. Well, I got lucky and I have not gone on dialysis nor have I gotten a transplant. Instead, I have worked very closely with my doctors, with renal dietitians, and I started living healthy, eating better, exercising, keeping my blood pressure under control, getting rid of all those things, those bad habits that could be hurting my kidneys. And as my health improved, so did my labs. And my symptoms, oh, I had a lot of them. They've slowly vanished away. I feel great and I have a ton of energy. And I started Dadvice TV to help educate other kidney warriors out there and kind of bring you a little bit of hope that there may be things that you can do to improve your quality of life while you happen to have kidney disease. Now tonight, the best place to learn is always from an expert. And we have an awesome expert again every other Monday with us. The author of Learn the Facts About Kidney Disease, Dr. Steve Rosansky. And this book right here, if you're new to kidney disease, in my opinion, this is the must-have book for every kidney patient out there. Not only is it easy to understand, but when you read this book, oh my goodness, you are gonna feel so much better. It is gonna take the weight, all that negative that you find on the internet, it's just gonna take it off your shoulders and you're gonna feel like, hey, you know what? I can handle this. I can do the things that are talked about in this book. I can kick kidney disease to the curb. Now let's go ahead and let's welcome our co-host, Dr. Steve Rosansky. Hey doc, how you doing? I'm good, James. Good to see you and good to be on your show again. Awesome. And for those that are new, tell them a little bit about yourself. Well, I am a retired kidney specialist. Uh, I treated kidney patients for over 40 years, and I've treated uh, patients with diabetes for over 50 years. Uh, since diabetes is uh, one of the main medical problems that people have be before I became a specialist. And it turns out that in my career, taking care of kidney patients, roughly half of all the people that go on dialysis are diabetic. So James has given me a wonderful opportunity to discuss kidney disease on Dadvice TV. And I wrote the book, Learn the Facts About Kidney Disease, because I know a lot of you folks have so much misinformation, so much, and I've I, hopefully I've gotten you to not worry so much about kidney disease and hopefully I've gotten some of you to avoid unnecessary starting dialysis. I also have found out by going into the social media, Facebook posts and other uh, support groups that so many of you have a lot of misinformation about diabetes. And so partly because of James and James is a very enthusiastic man and I give him a lot of credit. I am going to try to write my second book. And my second book is going to be about managing diabetes, all aspects of diabetes, and uh, diabetic kidney disease, which is a big, big problem mm -hmm. for diabetics. And um, there's a real, there's a, and, and we just discussed, I haven't gotten a title yet for my new book because it's not nearly there yet. But there is a lot of good news for diabetics, and that's one of the titles I'm thinking about, good news for diabetics. There is lots of good news, and I'm real excited about it. And there's so many newer drugs that are coming out that, that the kidney specialists are being told about. These are diabetes drugs that I call miracle drugs that are, that are game changers, that they are massive game changers. You know, 
diabetics think that all you got to do is control your A1C, and as we'll discuss tonight, that is wrong. That is mm-hmm. wrong. Uh, yeah, and new that's diabetics. Much the yeah. limited information we get if we are diabetic. You know, I was pre-diabetic. Luckily, I was able to get that under control. It pretty much is all about the A1C. That's it. Just like kidney disease, there's so much information that or education that's lacking between the patient and the doctor. And that gap just leads to confusion and worry on the patient side of things. And over-treatment, just like this over-treatment of kidney disease and over-diagnosis, as we're going to get into tonight, there's a lot of over-treatment and over-diagnosis of, of diabetes. And some of that over-treatment can be very harmful, as we're going to discuss. So you want to get right into it because we got a lot to oh, talk yeah. about. Oh, yeah, we got a lot of information. And, guys, if you have questions, post them in the comments because you know what Dr. Rowe does at the very end of the show. He loves to go through and pick questions and answer them. So go ahead, start adding them to the comments when they pop in your mind as we're going through this. And, and know that some of your questions and comments may well get into my book. So you may, be, you may become part of my book. So what about diabetes? It's a global ent- epidemic. Worldwide, there are about 425 million diabetics. And it's the leading cause of diabetes, uh, of kidney failure, and blindness. And it's also associated, just like CKD, as we've discussed many times, with hardening of the arteries and atherosclerosis. As a matter of fact, if you're a CKD patient and you've got diabetes and you've got protein in the urine, your risk is really, really high for atherosclerosis. And approximately one in three type ones, we're going to define them in a minute, can get kidney disease, and about 4 out of 10, about 40% of type 2s are going to wind up getting kidney disease. So a lot of you, when you're diagnosed with kidney disease or diabetes, you have a lot of fear, you have a lot of negative emotions, and that's one of the reasons I'm tr- going to try to get this book out. I'm going to try to help alleviate the fear, which I hope, hope that I've done with my first book for kidney patients, and I'm going to hopefully do that for diabetics. Whether you're a pre-diabetic, a type 1, or type 2, we're going to address in these talks and in my book that hopefully will come all of the issues that you may deal with. Um, And it turns out, just like with CKD, just like as we talked about, the main reason to know that you've got early stage CKD, which is the vast majority of you, is to control the risk factors for hardening of the arteries. And if you happen to have CKD with diabetes, and as I said with proteinuria, it is crucial. It has a huge impact on your life. You are going to live longer, absolutely, if you can modify your risk factors for hardening of the arteries and you make these lifestyle changes. And we talked about them over and over again. Pick the smoking habit. Try to manage your stress. Get daily exercise. And we're going to keep repeating this. Get your diet, plant-based diet, low in red meat and fats, and and low in refined carbohydrates. This is the recipe for a longer life. And it turns out, one good news right away, diabetics are living longer. So if you've just been diagnosed with diabetes, it's not a death sentence. You may live the long, just the same as a non-diabetic, mm-hmm. but a lot of it's going to depend on you and how you handle your diabetes. So... The book and the talks that that I'm going to do uh, with James uh, are going to talk about three main areas. The first area is things that all diabetics need to know. Uh, And anyone with kidney disease, I will certainly advise you to to read my Learn the Facts About Kidney Disease because that's not going to be dealt with. I'll I'll briefly talk about that if, if and when I get around to my new book. But uh, the new book is going to specifically talk about diabetic kidney disease and all the issues related to diabetes. Um, So one of the things that I was really impressed by is there is a 15-year randomized control study that showed that if you are pre-diabetic, you can delay or prevent you becoming diabetic. And you could do this. Eight out of 10 of you, if you take on what this study showed, the people that got uh, 7% small decrease in weight and, and exercised, uh, they decreased their, their risk of diabetes by half. 
And another thing that I'm learning about is um, bariatric surgery, which I thought was kind of, you know, dangerous. But it turns out this is surgery for massively obese patients. And James was talking about a personal experience that he's had with it in his Mm -hmm. family. And this surgery uh, can literally double your life expectancy and cure diabetes. And for many people, it's covered by insurance. It can lower your blood pressure, help you breathe better, help with sleep apnea, help with asthma, help with reflux, help with fatty liver, help with arthritis, help with stress incontinence so and depression. So many positives. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's not for everyone. <laughs> not everyone qualifies. You have to really be massively overweight. But, but you know, not to, you know, despair if you are. Another topic is labs, and we're not going to get into uh, discussing how to interpret your labs uh, tonight, but that's going to be another night's discussion. And another thing that's going to be in this in this book and in our talks is a, is discussion of some of the myths and misunderstandings about diabetes. And being online, being on social media, just like with CKD, there's a lot of magical cures. Oh, there's yeah. a lot of alternative medicine uh, treatments, including a uh, a mixture of herbal things that's called curalin. Now I can't say. And there are some things that we'll discuss that may be harmful. I don't know that Mm -hmm. curalin is harmful. But here's my deal. Don't get hung up on these alternative treatments when you have treatments that we're going to talk about. Really game-changer treatments that have been proven by these massive what we call randomized control studies. This is the the top of scientific research where half the people get the the, uh, intervention or the drug and half the people don't. And there is, if, if, you, if you are going to focus on the alternative, the problem for a lot of you is you're going to miss out on things that really may help you live longer. Yeah, and it's, it's uh, amazing how, how something as simple as exercise and even just small changes on, on your diet can have a positive effect. And they're not too difficult to start working into your lifestyle. I'm not a fan of taking pills of unknown ingredients. Um, and I've seen enough of the scams out there that just take so much money and give you nothing. <laughs> we'll dig into that in detail. The other, th- another thing that I think I'm going to include in the book is a lot of diabetics and all of us have emotional issues mm-hmm. and diabetes is tough to manage. And if you can, if you can handle some of the emotional problems, you're going to do a much better job in managing your diabetes. Another topic that we're going to discuss is what are the best medicines? There's a whole heck of a lot of medicines out there. And like I said, there are these newer game changer medications, which will not only help control your blood sugar, which they do well, but they can lower your blood pressure. They can help you lose weight. And best of all, and this is really massive, they have been demonstrated to decrease your deaths from heart attacks, from strokes, and decrease your chances of getting hospitalized with congestive heart failure, the commonest reason why diabetics uh, get to be hospitalized. Mm -hmm. And the thing that most diabetics and actually most clinicians miss out on, they they miss this, is that, yes, A1C control is important. A1C control matters, but it matters not for every diabetic. It matters if you are a new diabetic, if you are a younger diabetic, because then you definitely can prevent the complications of diabetes with Mm -hmm. what they call tight blood sugar control. The problem for most clinicians is it doesn't matter what your age is. They're going to try to get their your A1C, and and tonight we're going to just briefly talk about it. This is a a measure of your sugar, uh, of your blood sugar for around three months. They're going to try to get it to this magical number of seven or less. And guess what? Many studies have shown that this can be harmful. It can actually shorten your life. As opposed to the drugs that just lower A1C, these newer drugs have real benefits and they can slow your kidney function decline. And there's lots of good news out there. So that's why Mm -hmm. I'm excited to write this book and talk about this stuff. 
the other, so there's the general topics for all diabetics, and then there's two other basic areas. One area we'll call micro or small blood vessel disease. What's the small blood vessel disease that diabetics get? It's the small blood vessel disease that causes the kidney problems, that causes eye problems, so-called diabetic retinopathy, and the nerve problems, diabetic neuropathy. And as I just said, if you are a new diabetic, whether you're type 1 or type 2, a younger diabetic, tight sugar control can prevent these micro small blood vessel complications, microvascular complications. And again, we're going to spend a lot of time on the older folks. Just like older folks are overdiagnosed with CKD, older folks, us poor older folks, and I'm an older folk, I'm 74, we are getting treated to get our A1Cs to 7 when that's not at all useful and it's dangerous. So we'll discuss that in detail. And I'm guessing uh, some of it is some money for the all the drugs being pushed. <laughs> you know, we can't help the advertisements on TV. I mean, you all see this. And, and, and look, I mean, on the other side of the coin, I have to give credit where credit is due. The drug companies are spending a ton of money on these newer diabetes medicines. And they're not only using them to get your blood sugar under control and help prevent you know, the heart attacks, the strokes, and so forth that I just said, and progression of kidney disease, they're actually even using it in non-diabetics. So these drugs are game changers. They're big mm -hmm. time game changers. So the other <coughs> area is the big blood vessel disease, the so-called um, macrovascular disease. And we'll get into that in a minute. So under the small blood vessel disease, we have diabetic CKD. And I discuss briefly diabetic CKD in the Learn the Facts. All the basics about kidney disease is in that book. But we're going to dig in real deep into the diabetic type of kidney disease. And as many of you who have heard me talk on, on James' show, you know that a lot of CKD stage 1 to 3, there's a misdiagnosis. A lot of you don't even have kidney disease. Uh, but the thing to know is, is, as we've mentioned over and over, is that urine protein is a key factor, probably much more important in terms of your long-term chances of getting kidney failure, having to go on dialysis. It's your level of urine protein that's critical. And this is especially critical for diabetic patients. And there's been a ton of research for diabetic patients with protein in the urine, which has demonstrated, and I've mentioned this over and over again, the two types of drugs that diabetics or anyone with protein in the urine, especially diabetic with protein in the urine, because that's where most of the research has been. The ACE drugs and the ARB drugs, they're absolutely very important to slow decline of kidney function. But now we have other drugs to add to the ACEs and ARBs, the diabetic control drugs, the, glu the, the glucose lowering drugs that are going to be game changers for diabetic kidney disease. And the thing that, one of the reasons why I want to bring this to a book and I want to bring this out on these discussions is unfortunately, even though the information is out there, it takes years before patients are going to get the benefit mm -hmm. of that information. So I want all of you to know this up front and soon so you can ask your providers to get you the right treatment. Now, one of the things that we've also talked about on the show is the emphasis on all kinds of books for kidney patients about low protein diets. And there is um, a very popular book that I've seen on, on Amazon with my book where the, this is a, written by a non-physician. Uh, I haven't read the book, I'll admit, but I, this, physician, this person who wrote the book pushes uh, these supplements and just make it very clear I am against low protein diets for patients with CKD with exceptions. If you have stage four, not before stage four, and that's where the research has shown benefit. And if you're not diabetic, that's the time that aggressive low protein diet 
with the stuff that people are selling online. It's called the keto analogs because if you're on very low protein, you're going to need these particular molecules to get the rest of your proteins that are essential. But if and you're diabetic, where, and that's where a dietitian is really important to help you determine: Do you need those, and are you the right person for a low protein diet? Because a diabetic can be in trouble if they go low protein. Correct? Exact, exactly, James. And the International Kidney Doctor Organization recommends against low protein diets. For any CKD patient, no matter what stage, even if you're stage four, and there's been no evidence of low protein diets benefiting. There's very little, if any, evidence that they benefit diabetic CKD. Um, so the other small vessel disease, which anyone who's diabetic, I would assume, knows about, is the small vessel disease in the back of your eye called the retina. It's called diabetic retinopathy. And if you're a diabetic, <clears throat> no matter whether you're type 1 or type 2, <clears throat> excuse me, it is critical to have your eyes examined at least once a year because you may have these changes in the back of your eye that can cause blindness. If you get your eyes checked once a year, it's almost non-existent. You will not have the diabetic retinopathy causing blindness. You will save your vision. Absolutely critical. Let me tell you, back in the early days, in the 70s, when I was doing my training, I can't tell you, it was very sad how many diabetics were blind. They were walking, they were just so many diabetics on dialysis that were blind. It's preventable. We have lots of good treatments that we're going to discuss, but the important thing to mention tonight is to be sure to get your eyes checked at least once a year if you're diabetic. Now, the other type of blood vessel disease, make it simple, you have small blood vessel disease that will cause damage to your kidneys, your eyes, and the nerves. And as we said, you can decrease kidney disease, eye disease, and nerve disease if you are type 1 or a type 2 and you're recently diagnosed and you can keep that blood sugar under tight control. The macrovascular disease are the large vessels. This is also what we call hardening of the arteries or atherosclerosis. And again, your risk of this is extremely high if you are a diabetic and you have protein in the urine. Your risk of getting a heart attack, a stroke, uh, or having a problem with blood supply to your, to your, to your feet, especially, uh, and potentially having to have an amputation. It is critical that you take the risk factor modification seriously. You can, if you take this seriously, you can decrease the chances of having one of these bad outcomes. You've got to get your blood pressure under the right control, which we've talked about. You've got to get your cholesterol, your LDL, and I would go for under 70, James, for diabetics. And even if you are a young type 2, which we're going to get to in a minute, mm -hmm. get on cholesterol-lowering medicines because you are at extremely high risk. We'll talk about that in a minute. Now, you said type 2. What about type 1? Are they also type, at that risk? Type, right. So type 1 diabetics, uh, the problems are the same. So uh, risk factor modification is important for type 1 or type 2. Type 1, especially younger, early onset type 1, if you take your type 1 diabetes seriously, and we're going to define it in a minute, and there is there's some new really cool devices. There is what they call a closed loop device, which monitors your sugar and gives you the right amount of insulin. I mean, that's as good as it gets. If, if is, that, you, is that what they call the pump that they wear? Yes, that's okay. insulin pumps. But there, but the FDA has approved something we've been waiting for, and I've been looking for for decades. Besides the pancreas transplant. Uh, these closed loop pumps, monitoring your sugar, giving you the right amounts of insulin. If you do that, you can prevent the microvascular disease 
it the again the a1c control is not as impressive in terms of the macrovascular disease but risk factor modification is important for all diabetics it turns out james the reason why i don't emphasize it as much is be but it's important is because a lot of type 1 diabetics do not have the problems with obesity and lack of exercise they mm -hmm. a lot of them are are actually quite fit uh, yeah, you know. uh, I'm thinking of, of one of my nieces who's type one and she's fit. She's active, you know, loving life and out there doing things. And, and 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 she's a vegetarian, too, which is helpful for her staying fit. Yeah. Now, listen, I mean, plant based diets. I'm all for it. I'm all over that. It's great. It's great. Type one It's great. Type two It's great for CKD, you know. Uh, absolutely, James. So let's kind of get into definitions. So first of all, what is diabetes? So let's get into the basics. You eat food. What is your food composed of? Fats, proteins, and carbs, carbohydrates. They're broken down during digestion. Most of you probably know this, but carbohydrates are broken down into sugar or glucose. And this goes into your blood. And when your blood sugar goes up, what does it do? It Get your gland in your belly called the pancreas to release insulin. So there's two types of problems if you're diabetic that you may have regarding insulin. Either your body doesn't produce enough insulin, which is the case for type 1. Type 1 diabetics, they, their pancreas is not producing adequate insulin. Or your body is not using insulin the way it should use it, and you have something called insulin resistance meaning your body's not responding to the uh, insulin the way it should and that causes your blood sugar to rise and um, this is the case in pre-diabetes so pre-diabetes what does that mean your sugar is not quite high enough or your a1c is not quite high enough to be called diabetic and uh, what are the numbers? And, and we're not getting into the details of lab tests tonight. But for diabetics already know this, the types of numbers that will define prediabetes are what they call impaired fasting glucose between 100 and 125, a two-hour after-meal glucose between 140 and 200, and an A1C between 5.7 and 6.4. So here's the deal with this prediabetes. Just like the stages of CKD, a lot of you are being told you got prediabetes, you're worried, you're, you think you're going to die young, and it's just not the case. It turns out that two out of three of you who would call diabetes di prediabetic are not going to have diabetes in 10 years. So Maybe one out of few, three may have it. So it's not everyone with prediabetes is going to become a diabetic. And as we talked about, and we'll talk about again, there is a 15-year randomized controlled trial that showed if you are a prediabetic, you can cure it. 7% mm -hmm. weight loss, not a lot of weight loss. Getting your right amount of exercise with or without taking something called metformin, which, we're, which is one of the diabetes drugs. So... Is a lot of uh, the experts, endocrinologists, experts in diabetes, think that this is a way, way overused term. It turns out that half of all people in China would be pre-diabetic, according to these criterion. And one out of three people in the U.S. and the U.K. would be pre-diabetic. I think that's way, way over-diagnosing it. And the other thing is... Uh, the complications of, of diabetes are from long-term high sugars. And there's no magical cutoff value. So a lot of people say, well, you know, we're given these arbitrary magical cutoff values. The basic thing is the higher your, your, your sugars are over extended periods of time, the more likely you're going to get at least a microvascular disease, the eye disease, the nerves, disease of the nerves, uh, and the uh, disease of the kidneys, um, and, and, and some effect uh, on the atherosclerosis. Again, 
atherosclerosis not as impressive in terms of being able to uh, make an impact on it with A1C control. There is some data that shows yes, but there's some data that says no. Now, uh, and, and so uh, what about type 2? 95% of you who are diabetic are type 2. And how does type 2 develop? It develops gradually. And this is especially people that are overweight. They become resistant to insulin. Uh, your body becomes resistant. So what is, happens then? Then the pancreas keeps pumping out the insulin. And what happens, you, your pancreas can't pump out enough insulin and your sugar levels rise. It's common for people with this problem to be obese. Most uh, 7 out of 10 are obese. Not everyone. 3 out of 10 are not obese. So don't think that everybody who's obese has diabetes or People that are thin can't get type 2. You can get type 2 even if you're not obese. Because it's not um, an obesity problem. It's your pancreas not keeping up with the needs of your body. Right. Well, the obesity is, is related to it. Obesity cre creates insulin resistance. Obesity, therefore, creates this insulin resistance, gets your, your pancreas to continue to pump out more insulin. And the best way... To get your insulin resistance to be normal is what, James? Two Wait, ways, two on. things. I was reading comments. <laughs> what was the question again? <laughs> okay, the best way, if you are insulin resistant, to overcome, if to get your body to overcome that insulin resistance, get back to normal, is what? Two so things. for me, just, I had to cut carbs. I had to reduce them and exercise become a lot more active. That's what worked for me. Exercise will make your body more sensitive to insulin. I cannot tell you just how much exercise has been demonstrated with good science to benefit so many things. It is the one thing so much more important than all of the medicines people push and and all the various kind of woo-woos that people push, <laughs> exercise is critical. It will get your body to respond better to your insulin. And when you're talking about exercise, you're not talking about going to the gym for three hours, soaking sweat, lifting weights. You're talking about getting moving, walking, gardening, doing, you know, playing with the dog, playing with the kids, just getting up, getting your heart rate going. You don't have to run to the gym, everybody, and, you know, pretty much kill yourself in front of a bunch of equipment. Start moving. <laughs> That'll help. Yeah, I mean, basically, the best thing that I recommend for folks who are not, um, you know, not used to doing a lot of exercise and you don't want to build... I think it's great to do all kinds of things. I think it's great to try to keep your muscle intact, which I'm trying to do as they get older because your muscles atrophy. They, they disappear. So it's good to do some, some weights if you can. But you could do the simple stuff like just walking. And, and, you, and if you do roughly, you know, 30 minutes, five days a week, you are doing great. That's what you need, and that's what's been shown if you're pre-diabetic to keep you from becoming diabetic and to get your insulin resistance to become back to normal uh, response. So type 2 is much more common in obese people, much more common in African Americans, much more common in Hispanics, and much more common in Native Americans than it is in Caucasians. And there's a type of diabetes which we'll briefly touch on that you sometimes ladies get in pregnancy. Excuse me. This is called gestational diabetes. Now, I want to spend a few minutes on something that I find extremely disturbing. It's type 2 diabetes in children and teens. This has been dramatically increasing all over the world. Mm -hmm. And especially in China, I'm hearing so much, like half the people in China are pre-diabetic and you've got kids in China who used to China used to be all walking in bicycles yeah now and, nobody and walks active. anymore and you think of what do people do being active they are on their boxes they're on their iPads they're on their computers and this is tragic because here's the deal 
If you are a young person who gets diabetes, as we said, the longer your sugar is high, the more likely you're going to get the damages of diabetes. The more likely, so in other words, if you start out as a teenager with type 2 diabetes, your risk of getting a heart attack by the time you're 50 is enormously high. So it's the longer you get exposed to these high blood sugars, the more your risk goes up. So why do kids get this? Well, some of them have uh, obesity is the main issue. Family history is another issue. And lack of exercise. Very simple stuff. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of kids who have it, three out of four, have a, have a relative with it. But here's the deal. Some people say, well, maybe it's genetic. Probably not. Probably it's the fact that you as a parent are sharing the same diet and the same lifestyle as your kids. <clears throat> so <clears throat> by changing your diet and getting involved in, in family exercises, you could save your kids' lives. You can have your kids have a normal life instead of having it cut short with complications of diabetes. And you need to consider a family plan that you change the diet, get rid of the sugar drinks, drink more water, eat more fruits and vegetables, and get your family out doing exercise. Exercise. Have family fun exercise activities. See, my kids have gotten into the family walks at night. Now that we're past winter, the sun goes down, and and we're on the hunt for cicadas. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we do our family walk, and we yeah. have thousands of cicadas in our yard already. We so please many of them. <laughs> do do not try to use pesticides on cicadas. No, because, we're just letting them live, letting them do yeah, their thing. Because because they, first of all. You should let them live. They're harmless. Mm -hmm. And these pesticides are going to harm you and the environment. Anyway, type 1. Let's, let's talk about type 1. It's only 1 in 20 of you out there who are diabetes, diabetics are type 1. And um, type 1 can happen when, when there's a type of antibody called an autoantibody produced by your immune system that attacks your, your insulin-producing cells of the pancreas so-called islet cells, usually starts uh, in childhood and adolescence. Type 1 usually starts early in life. And there, there is a genetic test, uh, but <clears throat> it turns out that if you have a family history um, and you have a positive genetic test, it's only one out of five that are going to get type 1. It turns out that... Um, if you don't have a family history, just this genetic, there is a genetic test. You only have a 1 in 20 chance. So it's not a real useful test. Only 10% of type 1 patients, uh, new onset uh, type 1 diabetics, have a relative. So it's probably not genetic. And we really don't know what's causing di type 1. But here's uh, a quick as, question for you. Yeah, if yeah. someone is type 1, are they more likely than someone who's type two to develop kidney problems in their life since they start so early and it's something they really can't control? Absolutely, yeah. So we, as we said, uh, people with type two diabetes, uh, you know, maybe, um, well, it's roughly the same, roughly four out of 10 or one out of three. So basically around 30, 40% of type ones or type twos can develop it. But here's an important thing. <clears throat> if you are a type one diabetic, and you have tight A1C control, and you do not develop protein in the urine, you may well have a normal lifespan. It's a critical issue that we're going to get into in one of our later talks. Uh, and type 1 diabetics and type 2 now, uh, we've got the insulin pump therapy, uh, which, uh, which, as I mentioned, we have closed loops. Uh, and these are covered by third-party payers. These... Uh, methods of controlling sugars for insulin-dependent diabetics, especially type 1, especially your un young diabetics, clearly they're going to ha have an impact on longevity. They're going to increase the lifespan of type 1 diabetics. And the last thing that we're going to mention before we get out to your questions is gestational diabetes. This is diabetes 
that will occur in some of you ladies who get pregnant. Uh, but the good news is that um, that mothers uh, can control this usually just by the same things we're talking about, eating healthy foods, exercising, and some of you may have to take some medicine. Uh, and if you control your sugar, your baby's going to be fine. And most of the uh, ladies that uh, develop gestational diabetes, the babies are delivered early to make sure that the babies don't have any difficulties. Um, but James, as you were asking about type 1, diet and lifestyle issues do not cause type 1. Right. As opposed to type 2, so that's where you need to clarify. Uh, type 2, clearly, big, big relationship between lifestyle, obesity, exercise. Uh, type 1 is a whole different thing. And type 1 you have to be on insulin. You just don't get away from it. Some people with type 2 uh, eventually have to be on insulin, and we're going to discuss that in some of our later talks. So let's see if we got any questions tonight. Oh, that, we got uh, a lot of questions. Okay. I've been marking some of them. Let me go back to some of them. Um, uh, Sugar Ray asked, how do you control your pre-diabetes? Or I guess he was asking me, mine was exercise and I, my diet, I reduced carbs. I was eating way too much carbs, not enough fiber. My energy was coming from sugar for the most part. I had to get to where it's coming from other foods, healthy fats, protein, uh, but exercise. I worked that in, COVID hit. I cut way back on the exercise. I sit here. I've gained weight. My labs, as far as bl blood sugar, are higher, but they still look good. I'm getting back into exercise. My doctor's working on my uric acid right now. We're going to get that down, and then we're going to focus on everything else. Yeah, I mean, this is, as we just said, you want your body to respond to insulin. You want to get overcome that insulin resistance, which is what happens in type 2 and pre-diabetes. Exercise is the big one and losing weight. You don't have to lose, you know, 20% of your weight. You lose 7% of your weight in this randomized controlled trial. That's what it took to to decrease the probability that you're going to go from pre-diabetes to a type 2 diabetic. Yeah. Now Natalie asked, which is worse on your kidneys? elevated blood sugar or side effects from diabetic medication? I don't know of side effects of diabetic medication that hurts your kidneys. Let me think about it for a minute. I can't think of any side effects of diabetic medication. And um, in terms of, of the microvascular disease, as we mentioned earlier, if you are a newly diagnosed diabetic, a younger diabetic, you can decrease microvascular disease with tight control of your diabetes. Diabetes medicines do not have an adverse impact, to my knowledge, on your kidneys. Now, Katie asks, and it's about microvascular damage, can microvascular damage be reversed if you can get your diabetes under control and get a normal blood sugar level? You know, that's a great question, and I don't think it's been studied. What we would have to do, and, and let me just kind of give you a little bit of an aside. So I've diagnosed, I can't tell you, you know, hundreds of diabetic kidney disease patients, if not thousands, I don't know, lots and lots. How do us kidney specialists diagnose diabetic kidney? We don't do a kidney biopsy. We diagnose diabetic kidney if you've had, let's say, at least a 5 to 10 year history of diabetes and you got protein in your urine. We uh, don't we're do just assuming it's caused by diabetes. Right. And it turns out that there is a pretty good relationship uh, between having diabetic kidney and have diabetic eye disease or diabetic retinopathy. To answer the question that's been posed, which is a great question, we would have to be doing serial biopsies over time in patients that have tight blood sugar control and those patients that don't have tight blood sugar control. And we would have to see whether these changes reverse. My guess is not, but it's never been studied. Good question. 
Brenda has a very interesting question. Does stress contribute to becoming diabetic? I would say yes, for several reasons. Stress raises your things called catecholamines. Catecholamines, the flight, the, what is it called? Fright or flight, in other words, flight or fight, yeah. yeah, yeah in yeah. other words, the things that you, when you're under stress, when someone's, you know, threatening you, uh, these catecholamines that get your heart rate up and, 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 and boost the blood supply to your heart and your muscles, they also cause release of blood sugar. Long-term stress will cause higher blood sugars. So the answer is yes, stress will exacerbate uh, diabetes. Stress will raise blood sugars. And the other thing to know is that people that have emotional problems from their diabetes, they're real upset with it, that those emotional problems are going to make control of your diabetes harder. So getting control of your emotional state and your stress will help your diabetes for sure. Great. Sugar Ray asked, what symptoms can you pick up on if you have diabetes? So what are some symptoms of diabetes? Okay, so the common things that uh, people will first notice uh, if they're diabetic is uh, they may get thirsty, they may have increased urination because what happens is is that glucose serves as a diuretic. If you have high blood sugar, you're going to spill more glucose, you're going to have more urine. So diabetics may get uh, increased urination. They, they Some diabetics actually may have trouble with their vision uh, as sugars go up and down uh, and some diabetics may not know they're, they're diabetic until they develop something, especially this is for type 1s, called diabetic ketoacidosis. Uh, and that's a pretty serious problem. And that sometimes is the first time that someone knows that they have diabetes. Interesting. All right. Alice asked, if you get your insulin resistance fixed, can your GFR go up? Okay, well, you know, the GFR going up is so important for me to, to keep talking about. Because as we've talked about on this show, and I'll get back to the thing that I mentioned earlier. There's this low-protein diet bit, you know, try to you know, get people to take these keto acids. And there's some testimonials of, you know, eGFR going from you know, 55 to 65 or 45 to 55. Those are the same numbers. It is meaningless. A change of 10 or even 15% for a, a couple of values over short term doesn't mean a thing. For the most part, unless you have what's called acute renal failure, meaning you've got something that decreased your kidney function, and James knows about mm -hmm. this because that's yep. how we got hospitalized. You can be on medications, you can have low blood pressure, you can be dehydrated, you can be vomiting and having diarrhea. Um, that can get your kidney function to go down. And if you correct that, that gets your kidney function to go up. And a lot of these testimonials, my guess is that they're either lab results, which are really you know not meaningful. Mm -hmm. You know, one lab test could be varying by 10 or 20% to another lab test. Yep. Uh, or, and many of these patients had acute renal failure where they had a short-term decline in their kidney function and whatever was causing that short-term decline, one of your medicines that were stopped, your dehydration or what have you, kidney function goes back up. Yeah. And, and for those out there, your, your EGFR, it's going to go up and down normally. Um, I can tell in the same day, if I get up and I don't start drinking my water to get hydrated throughout the day and I go and I get labs at my doctor, the, the EGFR will be lower than 
later in the same day, I've done this twice, after drinking throughout the day, I go to the hospital and get it, and it's higher there because now I'm more hydrated, and earlier I was dehydrated somewhat. And so, again, that yep. that's not that's not an indication of the kidney disease, of your CKD, of your chronic mm. kidney disease, or whatever your stage is. It's not an indication that it got better or worse. And all of these things, whether you push in fluids, as James just talked about, mm. or some of the woo-woo, you take this thing to lower your creatinine, doesn't help your kidney disease. Again, creatinine is just a marker that we use, this creatinine lab test, to measure kidney function. Yep. Getting that We're creatinine. Do a video sh- all about creatinine isn't the problem. That needs to yeah. be the name of the the, the video. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we talked as about kidney that. patients since it's the marker they use. We assume it's bad, and we think, oh, it's bad, but it's not. <laughs> it's not the it's not the culprit. Not at all. Yep. Here's a great question. Um, Bev asks, "When will your new book be out?" She said, "Soon, I yeah, hope." <laughs> I I hope. Listen, and I give James credit. Because I'm, you know, uh, I'm not, I'm not driving myself hard. Although here's what I'm going to do. I again, I think your questions are great. I appreciate it. I love being on this show. But I'm going to be preparing more and more parts of the book as we discuss more and more of these topics on Dad Vice TV related to diabetes and diabetic kidney disease. I will not be giving up on other topics that are not related to diabetes, diabetic kidney disease. But I will certainly be having a lot of my upcoming shows and hopefully components of this book that will be part of this deal. Yeah, that's allowing us to get a sneak peek at the content in your book before it comes out so we it. can start implementing those today yeah. to hopefully head off problems in the future, which really that's yeah. that's the key to living with kidney disease, making these small changes today so that our future is better and longer and, you know, that's pretty much the goal. Yeah. The goal is to have a normal life expectancy, whether you're diabetic or you have CKD. The goal is to at least have a normal life expectancy. And it certainly is possible, no matter what the problem is, whether it's diabetes, diabetes with kidney disease, or just CKD by itself. Yep. Now, here's one I don't know if you can answer today, but Katie asked if you could please discuss contribution of saturated fat and... I don't know what that other word is, and I'm going to butcher it. Lipids and liver fat at creating insulin resistance. So maybe that's something for a future okay. show. Or well, today? okay. So so here's the deal. Um, fatty liver is a a serious topic. So what does fatty liver relate to? Fatty liver relates to obesity. And uh, and there are some people that get fat in their liver that actually get chronic liver disease. So that is definitely a, a problem. And there are there's a lot of research going on about fatty liver, its connection to chronic liver disease, and ways to treat it. But the best thing, and all the things we're talking about in terms of lifestyle, exercise, and weight reduction will help the fatty liver problem with the theoretical production of liver disease. You get scarring of the liver with a fatty liver. All right, so Karzan asks, and sorry Karzan if I mispronounced your name, um, how often should we test for protein leakage? Okay, so basically anyone who's diabetic at least once a year. If you are a diabetic or a kidney patient that has protein in the urine, I like to try to get that urine protein down with various medications, and we're going to discuss the newer medicines, the diabetes medicines that are having a marked impact on decreasing the urine protein. I like to do it every time I see a patient, and depending upon their stage of kidney problems, I may see them every three or four months. So then I will measure it then but if you are a diabetic any diabetic absolutely at least once a year get your urine protein checked because you want to head that off early if you got protein Mm -hmm. in your urine you want to get the right treatment for that to prevent progression of kidney disease and you also want to get your eyes checked to prevent diabetic retinopathy and blindness it's totally preventable 
Yeah. Here's a great question from Lisa. And we talked about this in a past show and we've hinted on it in this show. She asked, is there a diabetic medication to help with lowering protein leakage um, along with diet, exercise and hydration? Can you mention what those medications are for her? So they're called, now I'm not going to give them the list because I'll butcher them. They're called <laughs> S is in Sam, G is in good, L is in Larry, T is in Tom too. Uh, serum glucose transport inhibitors. There's, the, the companies that make these drugs rightfully want to get them out there and sell them because they've done good research and they work. So it's not just the SGLT2s. There's something called GLP-1s. This is going to come in a future talk. GLP-1s are injectable. Some of them are every day. Some of them are once a week. These types of drugs, including new drugs that are called mineralocorticoid inhibitors, and those of you may have heard of spironolactone, that's called aldactone. Mm -hmm. There's some newer ones that have been studied. All three of these classes of drugs, the SGLT2s, the GLP1s, and some newer mineralocorticoid antagonists, good research showing slow the de decline of kidney function and decrease urine protein. Lots to discuss, so we'll discuss it, I promise. Yeah, and one of our past videos, I think it was either the last or the one right before that, we mentioned them and I put them up on the screen. Jody has a great question. I have small vessel disease. They found it on a brain scan. She And the doctor told her it's PKD related. Is that what you were referring to earlier when you were talking about small vessel disease? Or is yeah, that Okay, else? so that's a, that's a great question. So the small vessel disease is not the cerebrovascular disease. That means blood vessels in the brain. The blood vessels in the brain get affected by the atherosclerosis process, which is the microvascular disease. Even though the brain has small blood vessels, when we're talking about small, we're talking about tiny. We're talking about the tiny blood vessels in your glomeruli, the units of the kidney, or the tiny blood vessels in the back of your eye, in, in the retina. Um, no, the blood vessels in the brain, to my knowledge, there has not been any research that relates any of the control of blood sugar to blood vessel disease in the brain. Again, this is a atherosclerosis process that you can decrease. It's a macrovascular type. All right, we are getting to the top of the hour and I'm looking through the questions here. There's a few more that stand out. Um, let's see. While you look at anybody who's not gotten vaccinated, please get vaccinated, please. And the vaccines are just getting to be better and better information. You may not even have to get a booster. They're, pro they're probably going to be good against the variants. All the vaccines are safe, even the one that people worried about, um, you know, in terms of getting that blood thinning problem. They're all safe. So I highly recommend it. And again, if you've got CKD, your risk of getting a bad outcome with COVID is very high. Any mm -hmm. last question? Uh, here's the last one. In your opinion, what's the best ACE inhibitor treatment for pre-diabetic uh, protein leakage? Okay. The, the, um, so there's, there's uh, this is a kind of a, a tougher question. Okay. <laughs> so there's a couple components to this question. Um, the first thing is, 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 is it beneficial to use, and they're all ACE inhibitors, I think they're all the same. So there's two types of drugs that can be used to decrease the urine protein. The ACEs, um, like the Prills, and the ARBs, they end in TAN, Captopril, Losartan, two types. Um, and so there's been debate of whether or not um, these drugs will prevent you from getting diabetic kidney disease? The answer is not out. There's also the theoretical benefit of let's say taking metformin if you are pre-diabetic to prevent diabetes. Some evidence for all of that, the ACEs and the ARBs to prevent diabetic kidneys, metformin to keep you who are pre-diabetic from developing full-blown diabetes, but the the evidence is not strong for any of that. 
but that's a good question. Very good. All right, we are at the top of the hour. If you would like to get a copy of Learn the Facts about Kidney Disease, Dr. Rowe's book, great book. I recommend it for all kidney patients. You can go to the link in the description. It's go.dadvicetv.com slash book or visit your local bookstores. They would love to see you in there and they can order it, get it in, give them a little bit of love by ordering it through them. And then his new book will be out sometime in the future, but he's here every other Monday. We get a sneak peek. We get to ask questions and these questions may help drive some of the content in his future book. All right, everybody. I thank you all for being here tonight. If you haven't done so already, please click the subscribe button. I love watching that number go up over on YouTube and thank you, Dr. Rowe for being here. Awesome as always. All right, everybody. I will see you in the next video. Bye everyone.